Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, most welcome to this webinar. That is the first one, I think, in the uh, Nordic Concrete Federation. And it is organized by the Svenska Betongförening and Swedish Concrete Association in cooperation with the four other societies inside the Nordic uh, countries. My name is Johan Silverbrand. I'm heading this and moderating it, this um, seminar. This interesting technology, it has been uh, running for a couple of decades, uh, two, two decades, and it may give a revolution to, to society in the concrete business, uh, but it could also perhaps be combined with other types of concretes. On this slide, you see on the top left, that is the first uh, concrete printed house in Sweden. It was made by uh, the company Concrete Print with uh, Tobias von Haslingen. On the uh, uh, top right, you have the uh, uh, Tour <laughs> in Switzerland, which uh, is said to be the highest building in 3D printed concrete. And on the bottom right, you have the first uh, 3D printed concrete bridge. It is a pedestrian bridge in Madrid. And on the far left, you see uh, 3D printed concrete forms, which will be uh, um, left in place, uh, <clears> or <throat> lost forms, and they were filled with self-compacting concrete to be uh, to make uh, columns, that is, composite columns. And um, that was also a, a cooperation between my university, KTH, the Royal uh, Institute of Technology in Stockholm, and Concrete Print, and also the Tong industry. So these are possibilities. There are many, many more, and you will listen to them during this uh, seminar. Uh, uh, we will not make any uh, proceedings from this webinar, but uh, all of uh, the nine speakers are most welcome to um, submit papers to Nordic Concrete Research. I'm the editor, and I, I would be happy to, to um, receive uh, interesting papers from, from this uh, seminar. Then uh, there is a deadline in March 31, but I guess it is uh, too early, but there is another one also in September. Uh, here we will see the program I'm starting, and then we, have, uh, we will have three presentations from Denmark, two, uh, and two from Sweden, and then we will have a short break and then another pro uh, one from Denmark, one from Finland, another one from Denmark. And then uh, in the end, we will have one from Denmark, one, one from Norway, and one from Sweden. So uh, we do not have any Icelandic paper, but we have papers from all the other four countries. So with this, I will stop sharing, and I would like to invite the first speaker, who is Thomas Juhl Andersen from Technologisk Institute in Denmark, and he is going to speak about uh, N3XTCon, focusing on material development of 3D print, uh, printed concrete. So, uh, yeah, and thank you for, for the invitation, uh, Johan. Uh, the, the aim is here to, to present some of the, the results uh, we have for, from this uh, national project called uh, NextCon. Um, but also give some some uh, some more generic uh, thoughts about uh, how to to work with 3D concrete printing. Uh, the focus will mainly be on the the material development. Of course, uh, 3D concrete printing is uh, involves a lot of disciplines uh, and a lot of competences. Uh, could also have been about the digitalization and and so on. But I will focus on on the material uh, development. Uh, hopefully I can. I'm just having a little trouble. Now it works. Yes. Um, first of all, we started in, uh, in 2016 working with uh, 3D concrete printing. Um, the, the first uh, aim was to, to see what we could do with concrete, make it more interesting. In terms, in terms of uh, shapes and, and colors, uh, geometries, and, and so on. So these are some of the, the examples of, uh, of the elements we, 
we, we did in the beginning. Um, and after that, the, the focus has changed a little bit. So we are looking uh, more and more into sustainability uh, and it does not only involve 3D concrete printing, it, it involves uh, almost all our activities within concrete uh, nowadays. So we have this project uh, called Nexcon. Uh, it actually, it, it started in 2019 and it actually ended uh, at the end of last year. So, so it's uh, very fresh. We are still in, in the process of, uh, of recapping everything in, in this project. Um, and the aim was uh, more or less to, to, to see how we could take this technology and make it available uh, for, for the Danish concrete uh, industry. So we, we tried to have uh, the whole value chain uh, involved in, in the project. Uh, and together with uh, the Danish Technological Institute, we also had the, uh, the Technical University of uh, Denmark and University of Southern Denmark, and both of them will also uh, make a presentation to today. So the project uh, was focusing both on uh, on uh, on-site applications and also uh, prefabrication. Uh, and and how it was uh, was uh, distinguished was that for the on-site development, we we had the the company Cobot International, which is uh, nowadays a larger player in in in. Uh, in selling uh, printers for, for the industry. Um, so they were developing uh, uh, technologies for, for on-site applications with uh, their printer technology. And then we were helping uh, the element producer, uh, CRH Concrete here in Denmark to, to develop a, a robot-based uh, method to, to make concrete printing. So these were the two main, uh, main tracks of, of the project. And this image here is uh, from our setup at the Danish Technological Institute. Um, and I will not go into all the details, but I can just say that we have uh, a two component uh, pumping system. So you can see the, the letter A and F represents the, the two pumping systems uh, where A is for, for the, uh, the motor, the concrete, and then F is the, for the, the ability to, to um, uh, to send in additives uh, and and most likely uh, accelerators to to make the prints happen. I'll come back to the the technicalities uh, in a few seconds. So if we look at uh, at some of the uh, the challenges you you face when you are uh, you're doing three D concrete printing, uh, there is of course there's a lot, but you can also uh, narrow it down to to four. Uh, material-based uh, challenges or even paradoxes. You have the first one, you need to have a pumpable material, uh, which is of course uh, important. Um, and then you meet the first paradox because uh, not only it has to be pumpable, you also need to have it being extrudable, meaning that it has to keep the shape uh, just after you have printed uh, your layers. And then at the same time, you also need to have a, a very fast buildability, and that's where it mainly distinguished from uh, the more traditional way of casting concrete. Um, and then also, if you have uh, a, a layer time that is uh, too long, you might also uh, end up having troubles with your bonding between the layers. But if we look into the, uh, the pumpability, when we, uh, when we design a material uh, that is pumpable, we, we would uh, look into to design uh, a material with a low viscosity. Um, and then we also look into how we are using the aggregates. So we ensure that we have a good packing of the aggregates. Um, and then also the, the size and the shape is very important um, of the aggregates again. Uh, because pumping systems, they they also they often have a maximum of uh, of uh, aggregate size they can handle. So of course you need to to go below that. And then at the same time, we also see that more rounded aggregates are easier to pump than than uh, more etched uh, aggregates. So this is also something to take into consideration. And then we also adjust the the mix design. 
uh, using super plasticizers, but not too much because it can affect, of course, the, the extrudability. Um, and then finally, uh, more uh, chemicals, uh, because uh, normally we also add a retarder to, to our mix, because we know that, uh, that this is something where we would like a, a little bit of longer open time, so we have time to, to make our experiments. And this also applies for, for, for larger structures. Then we go into the extrudability and, uh, and when we design a material uh, that is also extrudable, we, we go for, uh, for designing something with uh, a high yield stress. Uh, so we have the low viscosity and the high yield stress. Um, and this is where we, for instance, go and, and, and add a viscos uh, viscosity modifying agent, a VMA. Uh, this is something that can, that can help uh, to, to control that part. Then we have the buildability, uh, because of course, when you go into 3D concrete printing, you will uh, very often, at least in the beginning, uh, see what we see on the, the left uh, uh, video here, that things collapse because you, you haven't got uh, uh, the right buildability of your material. So what we normally do is we add an accelerator and as shown before, we add it uh, into the nozzle so we don't get it into our pumping system uh, because you really want to avoid that. Uh, and I'm talking of experience here. Um, then finally, you, uh, you want to, to ensure that you have a good bonding between, you, between the layers. Um, and this is especially when you have larger uh, structures, uh, you can end up having a long layer interval. So what you basically want to do is to make sure that it is still, that it, it, it doesn't dry out. So of course you can keep it uh, uh, moisture uh, or somehow in, in the larger prints. Of course, when you're doing smaller prints, this is not something that you, you face this problem here. Then something about uh, uh, sustainability because um, of course what we have seen so far or at least up to uh, a couple of years ago was those very paste rich uh, mortars that we're printing with where we have aggregate sizes down to one to two millimeters and this is actually not a concrete uh, in Denmark at least we we can only say it's a concrete when we have aggregate sizes up to at least eight millimeters but of course, it's not only the point of um, being able to say that you are, that you can apply to to the codes and standards of concrete. It's also a matter of sustainability, because um, upscaling from mortars to concrete also makes it possible to to make greener mixed designs where you can uh, where you can have a lower CO2 uh, footprint. And at the same time, you also face some, some challenges, of course. I'll not go too deep into that, but you, you face some, some issues on the pumpability, but also, of course, the, the aesthetic, aesthetics, uh, the appearance of the, the concrete surfaces will be more rough than we normally see in those more paste-rich uh, mortars. So here's just uh, a, a cut sample of, uh, yeah, both a mortar and, and concrete where, where you can see we have aggregate size up to eight millimeters. And of course, it's not only the aggregates you can, you can, uh, you can adjust to, to ensure a more green mix design. Of course, the binder system is, is the, the, the most valuable part and the key to obtain it. Here we, we did some, these are just some chosen uh, mix designs. Uh, if you have the left one, we have the, the one we started with, a uh, very paste-rich uh, mortar based on, uh, on white cement from Alba Portland uh, with quite a high CO2 uh, footprint up to over 700 uh, uh, kilo uh, CO2 per cubic meter of concrete. And then we uh, switched to, uh, to using this future sem, which is uh, a cement type uh, based on calcine clay. Um, then we could reduce of course, the, the content, but we wanted to go even lower than that. 
then upscaling from mortar to concrete. We here are two examples of, uh, of concrete in the strength class C25 and C45, where we, first of all, upscaling using a, a traditional uh, cement and then going to the future sem again, uh, getting some, some lower values that is uh, more comparable to what we see in the industry of the more greener concrete types. Uh, so this is just a chart uh, plotting uh, different types of, of concrete uh, we, we have on the market today. So we are in the, the lower end. And what I'm just basically want to say with this is that it is possible to make, you can say a greener mix design, even though you also have to, to comply with the, uh, the, the uh, characteristics of uh, 3D concrete printing. Um, and this is something that has been quite difficult before. Then just a few things about characterization. Um, we have found out that uh, to verify your material before printing, uh, an, a normal slump test uh, is actually quite good. Uh, and then reaching a slump between 13 to 22 millimeter, uh, centimeters seems to be a good value. Of course, it should be based on a, on a material you have verified uh, before that. Uh, to, to characterize your buildability, we normally use a penetrometer uh, where you can where you can plot a chart like this. Uh, so we have on the, the lower uh, string, you, you have the values for a non-accelerated uh, material. And then the other ones are different types of accelerator we have added. And you can use this chart to, to find out which uh, uh, which amount of accelerator you should add to your material before uh, you end up printing. And of course, this will be dif different from, uh, from print to print. It, uh, it depends on uh, especially your layer interval. Um, so in that case, you can design it. After printing, uh, it's good to, to make some uh, cutout samples to, to do measurements. Here's a, a bending test, and you will do it in, in, uh, in three uh, three dimensions uh, because it's not a, an isotropic uh, material uh, due to the printing process. You also want to look whether you have a, a perfect bonding between layers. Uh, also, if you have reinforcement in your in your print, you want to be sure that uh, the encapsulation is uh, is perfect. Uh, here's just an example where we did some experiments on on printing around rebars, and here's of course important to, to verify that, that the, the process is, is as it should be. We have uh, collected all this data in, in, our, in a deliverable from the project. It will be uh, available uh, during uh, the next month or, or so. Uh, so hopefully you can, you can have a look at these. It's in English, so it should be possible to, to read. Then finally, uh, just want to show uh, just a few examples. Uh, we have two demonstration projects, one uh, on-site and this one off-site. Uh, and what we did was to, to go further with this uh, off-site uh, uh, unit thinking. Uh, it was uh, made by the big uh, architectural firm in, in Denmark. And we, make, uh, we made this uh, prototype of, uh, of three units and tried to stack. And it was an example of, of uh, showing uh, a, a way to, to use uh, 3D concrete printing uh, with uh, prefabrication. Uh, it needs a little bit of uh, finish before it's, it's actually finished. It will be done within a short time and hopefully we can present the final results very soon. That was everything for me. I, I go on with the next presenter, and that is uh, Helena Westerlin from KTH, the Royal, Royal Institute of Technology. And she is going to speak about towards the application of mesostructures and 3D concrete printing. So Helena, you have the screen. Thank you. And, and thank you, Johan, for organizing this event. Uh, I had to confess, I had no idea we were so many active researchers. Uh, working in this field. So this is a very pleasant surprise, I have to say. Um, um, so th the title for this presentation is Towards the Application of Mesa Structures in 3D Concrete Printing. 
Um, so first, I just want to uh, begin by sort of explaining a bit uh, what this means. Um, so I think a good place to start is to is to think about how we work with concrete currently with with sort of standard uh, fabrication methods that is casting. Um, so in this process, the, um, the material is poured into a pre-prepared mold, and we are able to sort of design the material both at the macro scale in terms of the shape and the sort of dimension of the final um, building component and at the macro micro scale uh, in the sort of in the composition of the constituent ingredients of the material. So both these sort of uh, aspects of concrete design will affect how the material performs in its uh, intended use. So in, in concrete printing, then on the other hand, we, we shape the material at the level of the nozzle, which is typically much smaller than the final element that is to be fabricated. So this opens um, sort of new opportunities for then controlling the distribution and the internal structure uh, of concrete at a previously impossible scale. So this is what um, we identify as the, the meso scale. Uh, and I think this uh, this potential is really like the most interesting aspects of concrete printing because it's um, it really represents something completely new that we haven't been able to do before. Um, so it's not just the composition and the shape that matters, but also the distribution. Um, so then by designing the sort of print paths directly then, we can vary the sort of the spatial structures and densities over a printed volume, um, which will significantly the effect uh, it, the, the material's performance. Um, so this can open up for new sort of aesthetic qualities um, in concrete printing, uh, but also uh, how it affects structurally and the functional uh, properties such as thermal performance and acoustic performance. And I, I'm, I hope and I'm, I think we will see uh, probably examples of this in other presentations. Um, but so then this research focus on, on the meso scale um, was really um, sort of began um, during the work of my own, with my PhD that finished in 2021. Um, and it has been developed very much together with uh, Jose Hernandez Vargas, that you will hear from uh, later, and also Johan Silverbrand. Um, so I'm just going to talk about some uh, sort of past work and ongoing research uh, within uh, this uh, um, focus that we have. And first, I just want to mention a little bit about my introduction to this topic. Um, which started already in uh, 2011 when I was a newly uh, graduated architect. Uh, and I began working with the art studio in, um, in Spain, in Madrid, called Facto Marte. So they had developed a um, cement printing machine uh, and, in and then was sort of collaborated with uh, Anish Kapoor uh, and let him sort of use this machine to... Um, generate different uh, shapes. So this became like a, a, a art installation uh, at the Royal Academy. There was an exhibition in 2009. So this was before my time in, in Factum. Um, but I think what, what's so interesting about this approach um, is that it was really a sort of low data uh, um, um, approach to, to concrete printing. So all that then ended up being a very materially complex result. Um, and so I call this the sort of low resolution, high complexity approach to 3D printing. Um, so the, the instructions used to um, in these uh, sculptures were really just generated from an Excel file. So this was uh, really in the beginning of uh, before even sort of desktop 3D printing was a, a sort of widely household uh, technology. So there was not really uh, any of those uh, um, sort of two path generation uh, softwares that we use today. 
so this aspect of the resolution is so sort of intimately associated with uh, when we talk about 3D printing and architecture. And I think by comparison to this um, Kippur, but you call it identity engine approach, uh, is this project um, by Michael Hansmeier and Benjamin Dillenberger called the digital grotesque. So I think, you know, here we really see um, kind of harnessing the um, the the geom the, the the highest possible geometric detail of both sort of computational design using algorithmic design methods and then to 3D print in in a sand um, at sort of 0 0.3 millimeter or something like that resolution and I think this uh, 3D model consisted of more than a billion surfaces um, so this is sort of um, you know working under the assumption that data is unlimited um, and it's really a sort of um, a resolution that we're not really uh, used to encountering at the architectural scale. Um, and it's kind of questionable if it's even uh, necessary or if it's usable. Um, but I think an important thing to mention with this project and I think um, signifies most uh, adoptions of 3D printing is that it also very much prioritizes form over the material. So it's sort of imposing a form on a passive material. And so the problem with, with extrusion-based 3D printing is that it, you know, we never be able to reach uh, close to this kind of high resolution fabrication, because as we know, the nozzle size determines uh, the smallest uh, potential detail. So a direct effect of sort of scaling off then what was initially a sort of desktop technology to the building scale is that the printing process becomes this visible feature of the final object. Um, and this is something that is sort of sometimes um, accepted and other times it's considered an unwelcome effect and there's sort of post-processing methods one can use to sort of hide this, this layered structure of the 3D printed objects. So the question that I asked myself in the beginning of my PhD was how to turn this uh, into an advantage and how the sort of manipulation of the printing process could be, um, could be used to achieve a wider range of sort of possible surface effects than this. So it, this is seemed really limited compared to the potential uh, that was there. So what I essentially um, set out to do, or was interested in doing, was to go from, from, from a very sort of not having a self completely chaotic, self organized material system, but to devise a design methods in one in which one could sort of take um, advantage of some of the material behavior of the, of the material itself. And together with then the guiding movement of the printing nozzle. So this was um, sort of refining or uh, adding another level of control uh, to the approach used by Factum and Anish. So at this um, stage, I was really fortunate then to be able to uh, begin collaborating with Kose. Uh, and together we set out to develop this design method that was based on simply replacing really the straight line in a sort of typical print path planning with other uh, line types. So if you use, for example, an oscillating line or a loop line, the significance or the, dis the difference between a straight line is that you uh, introduce parameters such as amplitude and frequency that you can change and which radically then changes the outcome. Uh, in this kind of accumulation of lines into surfaces. And so this was one of our first experiments. So what we found really that we could create this sort of permeable effects and built in cavities that uh, wouldn't have been impossible to achieve with any other uh, fabrication method. So this, um, this method then is not unlike uh, really how how stitches constitute the smallest element in a knitting process. Um, so the, the sort of the print path 
in a similar way constitute the smallest element of, a, of the 3D printing process. And um, just like then this, uh, sort of the different uh, um, application of stitches can lead to uh, you know, an enormous wide range of outcomes. Uh, we realize that by introducing the stitch as the smallest element in, in the print path planning can also uh, would also then expand our the design space of our uh, of three d printing. Um, so I will think I will skip through this quite quickly, but so this is basically the the process process of then devising a sort of um, um, a script that um, allowed us to introduce uh, a, a wide variety of, of line types into this uh, into this design method by specifying a system of control points. So this uh, then led to what we call the library of stitches, which was then sort of the the, the ingredients or that we could uh, take off uh, take from when when generating our different patterns. Showing the process of the sort of the modulation and accumulation of stitches into patterns. So the important thing with this method uh, was really not the sort of uh, the the um, the the, the, the so ob final object themselves. Uh, but really how uh, the additive process can be used to introduce then a material complexity that is otherwise sort of out of reach for, in a standard design and fabrication um, process. So we used uh, this sort of block, which is uh, also from sort of knitting that where they use swatches to then try, then try out sort of different design outcomes from this method. So I recommend also uh, looking at this paper uh, called Knitting Concrete from a couple of years ago that would give more insights into this. Um, so in a later project, we sort of pushed this design method a bit further by also sort of speculating what would happen if we had access to sort of dual uh, color printing um, in concrete. But for this, uh, um, in this exploration, we used a, a clay printer instead. So coming back to this slide, um, our, in the current work then, it's about not just looking at the sort of aesthetic potential of, of, of the sort of mesostructure approach, but also how uh, the distribution and um, internal structure of concrete can be used to, to affect the other structural and functional um, properties. So this has uh, so far been the focus of an ongoing project called Digital Concrete, and together with Hossa and Yuan and other partners, um, starting 2022. Um, so the, the, the critical aspect then here is to see how sort of message structures can be varied across a printing volume to respond to varying uh, requirements. So, and um, the first thing we're looking at is the load requirements, because obviously this is the sort of, uh, we need to know this in order to know how to optimize uh, our structures. Um, and um, um, so as the first um, uh, step, we looked at some of the patterns that we already had, that we're already familiar with, to see how they perform structurally and to try to understand how the, the um, geometry of the print path of these non-standard print paths would affect the, the, the low brain capacity of concrete. Um, so this is the topic of uh, the, a recent paper. Uh, and I would just like, we're running out of time. You want how much time do I have left? Yes. One minute, two minutes. Two minutes, uh, two minutes more. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, the problem is when when looking at these sort of um, non-conventional uh, structures, 
And actually all the sort of our um, test methods, the way we calculate concrete um, is all based on uh, solid cast concrete. So it's really uh, quite a, a task to try to um, quantify um, the performance of these structures um, with current methods. But so we have looked both at uh, how to do this numerically, but then we also need to do it with fiscal testing to sort of then hopefully try to synchronize the two. Um, so in this study, we looked at three um, non-standard patterns and then a more um, conventional pattern using 3D printing with this sort of a truss uh, or the, the infill the triangle infill pattern uh, and then um, uh, test them um, to 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 maximum breaking point and and unsurprisingly uh, we found that our the sort of the patterns um a b and c do not perform as well as a standard pattern because they are uh, not not overlapping in each layer so sort of reducing the the point of contact but um, interestingly, you know, it, it is what we could say is that it is uh, possible to to um, affect the bulk density of concrete through the generation of these patterns. Um, and also that um, it, the geometry of the print part do significantly affect the, the final structural performance. So the base, the foundings from this study is then the basis of sort of the next step, um, looking at then how these uh, paths could be optimized in order to improve the structural performance. And so, so this is also part of, of Cosset's work that you will uh, hear later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eliana. I, I will continue. <laughs> uh, so I, I will ask uh, Jose Hernandez Vargas uh, to share the screen. And uh, he is going, he is also from KTH and he uh, has a paper designed for 3D concrete printing. Yeah, so I'll be presenting um, like kind of the uh, recent completion of my licentiate uh, degree on uh, concrete printing. And this is then already introduced this is um kind of continuation of, of this exploration of uh like let's say kind of non-standard uh, ways of of street printing or like kind of new approaches to design and how the um, uh, design tools can really accommodate for this uh, new process uh first uh, i i would um to uh, mention and thank all the sponsors for this project uh, which is like uh, both uh, financed by the Swedish uh, concrete, uh, sorry, the Swedish construction industry and um, um, uh, public um, funds. So uh, I um, and this is a collaboration between KTH, NCC, uh, Rice, and Rumble. Um, so uh, as a brief introduction, like what we are. Um, referring to with uh, 3D concrete printing is uh, this process of uh, material extrusion, which is um, uh, not, not uh, as, as uh, Johan presented earlier, there was this bridge, uh, that is also concrete, but it's a completely different uh, layer in technology where um, uh, dry material is um, selectively activated. Uh, but this, and it's also like this uh, new um, uh, common technology that is based on shot bridge which is uh, being um, developed in, in Germany uh, lately. So, but uh, the, the, the um, principles that we use in, in material extrusion are uh, more or less uh, being inherited from uh, plastic 3D printers that have become like kind of the most uh, predominant type uh, of uh, like kind of uh, massively available uh, simple systems uh, even though we are uh, mostly using robotic arms uh, the, the, the basic principles are quite, are quite simple uh, the um, accelerated pace has always been um, acknowledged by uh, research and industry and uh, here i just want to like enough um, 
point out that the Gnap most of the um, patents refer to the process, while the the most of the research is, is actually the material. Uh, and in this uh, trends, uh, I mean, this is already two years uh, uh, two, two years ago uh, was mostly like housing printings, but also some uh, infrastructure going on. Um, but uh, what I just wanted to point out here is like enough, even uh, we can see that like enough material is quite important. The, the design part has been like kind of more or less kind of un underdeveloped and mostly unchanged from uh, what was there before uh, with like small scale 3 printing. Uh, and in this uh, sense, um, we, we, we can kind of conceptualize the, the overall uh, process of uh, passing from uh, design to manufacturing uh, with this kind of uh, like multi-step process where a uh, design is, is more or less kind of constrained uh, to the overall design or what we can um, refer to as a kind of a, uh, like volumetric definition of the shape that is then like uh, put into a slicer and then transform into a print pass uh, for for the printing process. So in, in this paper, uh, we were trying to centralize the uh, this um, bottleneck that is uh, constraining the, the design uh, to to the first part, the kind of the cut process, and then there are like some optimizations, but the, the design is not longer a part of, of the process. Um, now, uh, in, in this uh, sense, uh, there are like enough, many ways to proceed. And normally, uh, you put like a simple volume that then is uh, procedurally filled with um, a certain printing pattern that is more or less kind of uh, predefined. And in this sense, uh, when working, especially when, with the concrete printing at a larger scale, the, this kind of automatic uh, process is very critical to have like full control of what are exactly the print path and and the, um, the exact motion of, of the printing nozzle. Uh, and for this, uh, we differentiate uh, these uh, like two possible approaches. One is uh, when you have a pre-slicing uh, manipulation of the shape that uh, you take a volume and then you um, subtract or many, uh, engineer some uh, custom material distribution and then you apply a normal slicing process. But the, um, there is also possible to uh, slice first and then have like a, a special curves that are then uh, processed and, and customized uh, as, as lines and not as a volume. And in this sense, uh, what uh, I, I'm referring here is, is also um, what Elena just presented, like kind of how the the print path is is the matter of design uh, rather than the the volume that it came from. So uh, this has also been conceptualized as multi scale design, and and uh, and the question here is how this uh, like advanced uh, print path planning. Uh, methods can be applied for, for concrete. Uh, so for this, uh, there was a um, first uh, paper introducing uh, like a state of the art in, in 3D printing, uh, of course, not, not only from concrete uh, perspective. Uh, and we are taking uh, this uh, example that uh, is um, a very like small scale high resolution printing uh, where uh, they put some uh, procedural uh, foams that uh, control the the flexibility of the material, and here the insight is that you are not uh, with with the digital processes. You are uh, not uh, just kind of have freedom in in geometry, but also in material properties that can be defined through the printing process. So um, the the here we we can uh, start thinking of not only three dimensional design, but also uh, this kind of color 3D model that have like certain um, extra degree of freedom that is, is represented by color, but uh, may represent like density or some other properties. Uh, and for this, uh, of course, this is not really um, uh, apl applicable yet in the scale of concrete, but have been some attempts to put like variable mixing ratios. Uh, 
uh, this is uh, of course before the the multicolor systems are not possible with the with the, the selective dosifying of, of these accelerator phases, but uh, uh, um, they may represent um, you know like the state of the art in in, in how we can um, grade uh, material properties in uh, through the printing process. And so uh, what I was uh, working with is uh, the relationship of of the printing uh, of the printed filament as a result of, of, of the the ratio between the extrusion speed and the traveling speed, how this can be used for uh, controlling the the resulting width of the of the filament. And uh, this is uh, thought of um, uh, applying a gradient that can be uh, controlling the, the printing speed and getting a kind of a selective um, selective control of, of the printing width. Uh, I should have a video here, but uh, I should be refusing to play. Um, I'm sorry about this. I really need to put here. Um, no, sorry, I, I have some issues with uh, this new computer. Um, but uh, what uh, I was also like uh, investigating here is like kind of when you apply a, a kind of a variable um, printing width uh, in the in the process, uh, you may also want to align um, this uh, variable. Um, variable geometry to constrain to one side of the print and we will see how this works later but uh, it's basically putting kind of a compensation algorithm to to um, restrict the effects on, on only one side of the print uh, so uh, for the next uh, paper was um, uh, integrated workflow that was uh, like uh, basically a, a bunch of scripts in in rhino that uh, take this graded 3 model and then uh, put uh, slicing or like a post slicing approach that you slice and then apply some uh, properties that are uh, controlled by the color of, of the model. Um, and uh, for this, you export and then complete the process while you normally need uh, to pass this uh, STL file that is, uh, is not able to, to contain anything but geometry. Uh, so this was applying to some design variations that were um, um, experimentally uh, applied, and then we have this. Um, this is uh, the setup we have at, at the CTH Architecture School, uh, which is uh, kind of a very manual system, uh, manual feeding of, of material. Uh, but on the other hand, it is much. Uh, Easy to work with than like operating a privacy cavity pump that we were using before. Uh, so this allows for small scale experiments, but you can print with two people in a very short time. Um, and uh, again, this is the the process of of just uh, adding material and controlling the the traveling speed uh, because uh, the there are some issues some issues with the controlling in real time the, the extrusion speed instead. Uh, since this material, uh, uh, like um, unlike the big systems, the uh, the mass is, is very small. So here it's, it's easier to just accelerate the robot. Um, so these are the results. Um, uh, you can see there is like a kind of a, a very faint um, Design that is uh, made from this uh, kind of multicolor design and apply for 3D printing. Uh, and here uh, uh, you can see there is like some uh, very sharp uh, contrast between the, the thin and the thick parts of the print. Uh, and this is uh, more or less one of the constraints of the process. I was uh, further exploring this other uh, paper that is uh, like on review right now. On, on optimized uh, beams that are uh, put as a kind of internal structure uh, with like an optimized pattern uh, in, in a continuous process. 
So um, these are the results that, of course, translate in this um, you know, complex topology into 3D printing is, is quite a challenge. So uh, here are the two optimized uh, beams with uh, kind of the, the optimized internal um, material distribution uh, applied to them compared with a like a standard or normal um, reference beam. Um, so I think here is um, is how we, uh, well maintain the the challenge is how well maintaining the external boundary uh, and the um, the continuity of of the three printing uh, we can achieve like a kind of internal optimized uh, material distribution. Uh, so this was um, print and. A cure and and the testing uh, show that uh, uh, if if we compare uh, by uh, load to weight or strength to weight, um, uh, optimized beams um, show like a very uh, high um, relationship when when you compare like uh, by weight normalized weight. Um, so yeah, these are the the results. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I hope it was okay with the time. You want? Thank you very much. And I would like to welcome June Sprangenberg from Danish Technical University to the screen. So please. Thank you, Johan. Do you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. And, and, and we we see your slide as well. Okay, that's perfect. So thanks for the introduction and also thanks for setting this up. This is really great to meet all of you and see that the, that many people are working on 3D concrete printing. Um, I'm an associate professor at uh, the Technical University of Denmark and also heading a section that is called Digital Building Technologies. And uh, today I will be talking a bit about the digital models for 3D printing in construction. I have changed the title just a little bit because I also had the uh, um, a small comment on how to print formwork instead of printing the actual concrete, but I hope that's okay and I will show a, a few examples about that. So the research that I'm uh, primarily related uh, or working with is related to digital fabrication and construction and we are touching different topics that are addressed here. So digital twins, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, robots and, and other stuff as well. And I will be touching a little bit upon uh, some of them, at least during this presentation, uh, at least the 3D concrete printing part. So we have uh, for a while uh, been working on 3D concrete printing and have been involved in different projects, uh, some projects related to using alternative binders. We have printed with geopolymer concrete instead of cement-based concrete. We have also been involved in uh, and are involved in a project where we are trying to print with uh, concrete where we are using uh, manufactured sand that's actually together with uh, Stefan and Nikin who is uh, here today uh, from uh, NTNU. But uh, what I will be deep diving a little bit more into today is uh, this uh, digital models for 3D printing and construction. And I have two examples that I want to explain. Mm -hmm. So why actually develop these uh, digital models uh, for 3D printing in the first place? Uh, that's basically because we want to get a better understanding of the process. And we also want to exploit the models to come up with some better printing strategies than what we see that we can get right now. Because many of the softwares that we are using right now are based on some simple geometrical considerations when they are coming up with some printing strategies. But uh, we can we can do better than that. And I'll hopefully show, we'll show a couple of examples of uh, how you actually do that. So um, the two uh, case studies that uh, I will show here is related to 3D concrete printing. And then as I said, 3D thermoset printing of formwork that you can then cast your concrete into. So uh, the first project uh, that I wanted to mention is actually this next kind of project that Thomas also mentioned uh, earlier. It was together with Cobot and also uh, Danish Technological Institute and a uh, few other uh, partners, as Thomas also mentioned. I'm not going to talk too much about why we are doing 3D concrete printing. I guess the people that are here today knows a lot about that. 
Uh, but I'm just going to say that uh, our objective for our part of this project were related to developing these digital models that can assist in uh, understanding the process better and coming up with these optimized printing strategies. And that was in this project, both with and without reinforcement. So the first thing that we did was to develop a computational fluid dynamics model. This is the one that you see here. And uh, we are trying to simulate this on a meso scale, uh, as Helena also mentioned, that uh, you can consider it as a, a global scale, or a large scale, and then meso scale, and then uh, a local scale. So this is more like a, a meso scale model, you could say. And you can also see that we are printing uh, multiple layers, and that the layers underneath the first, uh, uh, the first layer is deforming when we are printing multiple layers on top of that. Uh, but when you are developing these models, it's of course very important that you have uh, some physical results that you can actually compare uh, with. And uh, the guys at DTI helped us a lot with uh, creating some experiments that we could compare to with their uh, setup that you ha they have at DTI. So they did a lot of single layer and multi-layer strands with different process parameters, and then we cut them in order to figure out how would the cross-section of these materials or these uh, prints actually look like. And then we compared our numerical model with the cross-section of what we could see were coming out of the experimental results. And uh, as you can see here with uh, this numerical model, which uh, takes into account the reality of the, the, the printed concrete, then we could, uh, with a quite good um, accuracy, predict how it would be also in the experiments, both when you have a single layer and, and multiple layers. What I should say here was also that um, the real logical model that we used here was an elastoviscoplastic model. I'm not going to deep dive into how you are modeling concrete, because maybe that's not really the right thing to do here, but uh, it was just a small comment on that. Now, when you have this, uh, when we had this uh, numerical model that could simulate the process, then we wanted to understand how uh, does the process actually behave or the concrete, how does it look like when we are varying different material properties, but also how does it behave when we are printing with different printing uh, uh, parameters. And I have two examples here. So at the top, you could see that if we are increasing the yield stress, it's going from 100 to 1,200 Pascal, then we are decreasing the deformation in the bottom layer. That's pretty common knowledge, I would say, but at the same time, it's maybe not super common knowledge in, in what, um, what value it, 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 it should actually be. And our model could uh, say a bit about that. We also, uh, uh, change the, the process parameters to see how that would influence the printing. Uh, uh, and here you can see at the, at the lower figure that if we increase the printing speed, then obviously we would have more material extruded out per running meter or in the cross section. Um, or if we have, sorry, if we, if we had a low uh, printing speed, then we would have more, but if we increase the printing speed, then we would have, uh, have less. Uh, and then we can also see that it has an effect on uh, the, the deformation pattern. So that was some of the things that we were looking into to understand, again, the, the process a bit better. As I mentioned in the beginning, we also uh, would like to know something about how can we integrate reinforcement with our prints. Uh, the thing is, uh, many of the prints that are done uh, these days are non-load bearing, but obviously we also want to get to the point where we can print uh, and integrate reinforcement into our prints. And that was something that we also wanted to see whether our numerical model could say something about. Because um, it is obviously, if we want to do that, very important that we get a good connection between the concrete and the reinforcement. So it can be load bearing the structure that we are producing. So, um, Again, DTI did some experiments for us, and then we did the simulations, and this is the results that you can see. Uh, we basically found out that there was a quite good agreement between the experiments and the simulations, and the simulations to a quite good extent were able to predict the void formation that we would see around the reinforcement bar. 
Uh, so in this case, we, ex we experimented with us and simulated both a horizontal rebar, but also a reinforcement uh, bar that was horizontal and vertical. That's what you see here. Now, um, when it came to the horizontal rebar, then what we did was that then we used the numerical model to see, okay, how can we actually eliminate all the voids that we have around the, um, the reinforcement bar? And we found out that, and this is of course the strength of a numerical model, you don't have to do a lot of, uh, of experiments. Now, when we trust the model and we, we think that it's capable of reproducing what we will see in real life, then we can test a lot of different scenarios. So we tested a lot of different scenarios. And when it came to the horizontal rebar, then we just had to change some of the process parameters. But when it came to this uh, crust rebar uh, uh, configuration that you can see here, then it was not enough just to pr uh, print with different printing parameters. Then we also had to um, change uh, the printing path. And we also had to change the geometry, as you can see here. Uh, we, we played around with different geometries. Here we have a square, and here we have something with a small, uh, a smooth transition between the reinforce, uh, the horizontal reinforcement, and also the the vertical reinforcement. But we, if we did that, then we could actually uh, eliminate all the voids, which is of course what we want. Okay, so that was a little bit about what we did on the 3D concrete printing part. This here. Um, is uh, when it comes to actually printing the formwork and we wanted to print the formwork in a thermal set. And the thing is, um, I think you probably know that it's, it's the people are working a lot on figuring out how we can integrate um, reinforcement into our 3D printed structures. So the, that was actually the motivation uh, for doing this project that we didn't have to change necessarily the way that we do reinforcement. We just want to uh, still get the flexibility in terms of geometry when we are printing the formwork instead, and then we are casting into uh, a traditional reinforcement instead. Um, so we uh, developed an experimental setup. This is what you see here that is capable of printing with a thermal set. A thermal set behaves a little bit similar to what we know from concrete that uh, the, uh, as it has been uh, deposited, then there will be a chemical reaction that will enable the material to, to start curing, but it cures substantially quicker as compared to concrete. But it will still be this uh, wet on wet printing uh, which makes it a little bit difficult to know uh, or to make sure that you don't get any deformation on the bottom layer. Um, but uh, at the same time, since we are printing wet on wet, then we also ensure that we have a good connection between the, the layers. So the first thing that we did uh, in terms of this uh, project were to do some experiments and some numerical modeling of how should the shape of our nozzle be so we could remedy these um, uh, uh, ripples, you could say, that we see in the surface, right? You can see that there are some, some ripples in the surface, and now this is actually deforming in the bottom, bottom there. Of course, it shouldn't do that, but there are some ripples in the surface. So is it possible by changing the shape and to, to, to eliminate those? And uh, via this numerical model, we could come up with a shape that uh, was capable of printing what we see uh, over here. So basically something that is very straight. And that's also something that we can see is adapted in the concrete industry. Uh, but when you are doing it with a thermal set, I would say that it, it was a little bit more cumbersome. Um, then we, let me just go to the next slide here. We also looked into, it, uh, is it possible to uh, reinforce our thermal set structures with fibers, for example, because we want to use as little material as possible. And you know that the, the formwork needs to withstand the hydrostatic pressure of the concrete that we are casting into the formwork. And uh, we could see that uh, it would lead to deformations. Uh, and those deformations we wanted to, to limit as much as possible by uh, including some fibers. So what we did was to include a, a fiber model into our computational fluid dynamics model that I showed you before. And this uh, fiber model is then able to predict the orientation 
of the fibers. And uh, for example, uh, here you can see that uh, uh, a lot of the fibers are going in the printing direction. Some of them are going uh, not in the printing direction, but what we could find out with this model was basically that we can control the fiber orientation by changing the process parameters. And that's super interesting because now when we are doing our, our printing our structures, then we can design for, uh, include that design freedom uh, when, we, when we want to print a component. And I think this is uh, directly um, sort of transferable to, to concrete prints. So it doesn't necessarily have to be for a thermal set. Then we also, uh, looked into whether we could uh, develop a computer vision system. This is uh, basically uh, a, a two cameras that are installed on uh, our printer. And then it looks, like, it looks at how we are printing. And the idea with this system is that we on the fly will be able to uh, make changes. So information should be gathered and then uh, it could be potentially, we are not there yet, but it could potentially be some, uh, some machine learning algorithm that you are using in order to make changes on the fly if you can see that there is a problem. So this is also something that we are, we are spending some time on figuring out how to do. I can see I don't have a lot of time left, but I will just show a few of uh, the prints that we have done. So this is, uh, for example, an hourglass print that uh, we have printed and then we have casted it into. And uh, then we have also made um, a print that looks like this. Uh, here we uh, are using uh, the, the knowledge that we have gained from the 3D printing uh, technology that you saw before, but we are also doing some, some other process steps. It, sh it should be mentioned. Uh, but uh, the idea with this print is, of course, that it should look like the, the concrete has closing on. And that's, of course, nice and appealing from an uh, architectural point of view and a looks point of view. But uh, in principle, we want to use this technology to limit the amount of concrete that we are using in our structures. Yes, with that, I think uh, it's uh, my time is up. I just want to thank all the students that actually did all of the work that I was allowed to show here today. So thanks to them. And then I would also like to thank the funding bodies that has uh, uh, funded the work. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for, for an excellent time and the interesting uh, lecture. Uh, we go to next uh, speaker, and that is uh, Henry Unterreiner from the uh, Hi Hi Hyperion Robotics in Finland. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Mirva, actually, who I believe is on the call. Um, Mirva is actually from the Betoniolistus uh, Association in Finland, and she was suggesting that we should uh, present uh, to this group. So very happy to, to, to be here today. So I'll first start with uh, a quick intro of uh, our company. So we are a team of 26 people, um, engin structural engineers, architects, uh, but also mainly automation engineers, mechatronics, uh, mechanical engineers, all passionate to try to revolutionize the, the construction industry because I suppose there's no need to 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 to, to repeat it but uh, the construction could benefit from sustainable practices being accountable for eight percent of global co2 emissions but also is highly uh, inefficient this um, this picture is a, a picture I took whilst I was a resident engineer on site in London um, and you can count four people needed to cast a simple flat slab. So as a company, we have developed a series of products uh, that are highly optimized and that replace traditional monolithic uh, structures. In that case, for instance, this is a pad foundation. Uh, on the left-hand side, these are typically thick concrete structures. Uh, but on the right-hand side, we've got a more uh, refined structure I've heard from previous talks that uh, 3D printing enables placing the material where it's most needed. And this is literally what it is about. It's about um, carving out the material from the block and whilst obviously resisting the, the same loads. 
So this is our large scale uh, 3D printer. We've got uh, from right to left, we've got a silo, which uh, delivers a dry mix uh, motor. Uh, that motor is then mixed with water via this MTech pump, which is then pushed through. And um, once it's mixed, it basically travels through the hose and the robot is being uh, is holding the, the, the hose and placing the material very accurately. So as a team, um, we realized that we had to tackle multiple aspects, uh, which has been previously shared by, by the previous speakers. One is the material. So we've got a team of dedicated material scientists exploring um, how we can actually make printable materials, whether they are mortar paste, uh, concrete paste, so larger than eight mil aggregates, um, geopolymer, and, and the likes of sustainable materials. We also have a team of um, automation and mechatronics engineers who are responsible for play, for building the extruder head and placing all the sensors uh, that we need to control the quality uh, of the material as it's being printed. We are also developing the software that is able to speak to all these machines and coordinate them. And we also have a team of structural engineers, which I'm a part of, which um, designs those optimized structures. Uh, these are some of the clients and partners uh, we've been uh, fortunate to, to collaborate with. And perhaps a, a very quick example of how deployable this uh, technology is. Uh, this is actually a micro factory that we uh, inflated um, in Lahti, so one hour north from Helsinki. It's uh, an inflatable tent that was manufactured from a bouncy castle uh, fabricator in Romania, but it does serve very well the purpose. It, it is 250 square meters separated in two holes. One hole is for the printing of the elements. So 125 square meters of dedicated uh, printing space. And the next hole is where we want to cure all the elements. And you can see how the, the picture is, qu is quite um, hazy because there's a high humidity content and a controlled temperature in this hole. So across the board, we're trying to be more sustainable uh, because our material is made in large proportions from waste products and we're exploring more sustainable alternatives to cement. There's no foam work, uh, which means that we are able to be faster down to 50% in terms of uh, program and and an overall value chain uh, reduction. In terms of costs, they are typically, the savings are typically related to less labor, less material, less time on site. And since there's less people involved in the whole process of construction, we're also benefiting uh, with health and safety. Here's are some of the examples we've been exploring uh, from left to right. We've got a water tank made out of geopolymer. Um, this was uh, done like a couple of years ago um, and for, for uh, uh, a mining industry company. Uh, second picture is this optimized path foundation for an electrical uh, company. Then we move on to trenches, trenches that have different heights um, and geometries and widths uh, together with their connection nodes. We have been exploring also reef architecture and um, and marine substructures, but also we've been uh, playing around with very small applications like facade panels, uh, furniture, spanning structures, and, and staircases. Okay, so I'm going to move on to uh, uh, perhaps a practical example uh, to, to share how we, we have been working with clients. So this is a project uh, that we delivered last uh, last last summer. It was in partnership with a water company in the UK um, uh, uh, who was uh, supported by Mott McDonald ben Bentley, who are water contractors, and um, our material partner, Tarmac. So those projects started with a drawing sent from the clients uh, this drawing depicts a square box quite thick with quite thick walls, uh, a structure that is bending in 
bending against uh, the soil pressure, uh, we immediately proposed an alternative shape, which would help reduce by 50% the amount of material. So we did all the calculations to understand how um, the thickness of the, the draw pit could be reduced uh, so that we could actually uh, save on materials while still resisting the uniformly uh, distributed load coming from the soil and some unbalanced load like surcharge load from traffic around the draw pits. We then uh, developed a 3D model of the print, which you can see here, and did some FEM model analysis in order to ensure or satisfy ourselves that the structure will be fit for purpose. Um, here we've got all the, the reinforcement um, that is present inside the structure. And we went on to 3D print the, the formwork, the permanent formwork of the structure. So let me... Uh, so I'll speak over. So this is actually our uh, our arm. This is our facility in Espo. Um, we started printing this mortar um, in different layers, and every so often we were adding horizontal reinforcement. You can see that horizontal re reinforcement being perfectly centered within the cavity of it, and the robot was achieving this non-planar um, toolpath in order to. Um, draw the location where those pipes should be embedded. This is actually a very, uh, let's say, like typical mortar mix, similar to the ones we've been uh, able to hear from in, in the call. And after two hours and a half of printing, we reached two meter, uh, 2.5 meter of altitude, which helped us complete that, that drop it. So uh, this is the final results. We had four of them uh, uh, shipped to the UK. So um, they were varying in height. They were varying in distribution of pipes. And as you can see, our setup is quite uh, generous. So up to two uh, droplets could be printed at the same time. As, as a company, we're really looking for that large scale application of our technology. And one of my favorite anecdotes was a last minute change that came from the client asking if they could add four small pipes uh, through the, the wall. Uh, this was done on a Monday or received on a Monday. We updated our scripts and on the next day we were able to incorporate that last minute change uh, with no, no financial um, uh, consequences. So once we have printed that formwork, we then uh, casted it with uh, self-compacting concrete, and it was then time for us to ship those four, four large structures at the back of a truck. This truck then arrived in England, in Yorkshire, uh, where the engineers team, uh, the clients team were, were very excited to, to see uh, how they would perform. And this is actually a small picture, uh, sorry, a small video of the, uh, of the site. So as you can see, this is uh, a water treatment plant. There's a lot of motors and machines to be powered uh, via electrical cables and data cables. And that's where these drop pits have such many, um, such many uh, openings going through them. So these drop pits were then, once delivered, they were then installed uh, on sites here. And as you can see, uh, the fact that they were prefabricated in a sense, precast, printed, uh, enabled um, a speedy installation on sites, but also less temporary works, which would typically need to be much larger to welcome a team of workers uh, below ground down to 2.5, 3 meter uh, below ground to safely be able to, to work around the formwork and, and the rebar cage. So across the board, we try to be more sustainable, 40% reduction in embodied carbon when compared to uh, a traditional square drop it. This is actually including the transport from Finland in terms of cost. That also includes the cost of shipment to, to England. Uh, and we were able to save overall 30%. And we almost cut by three 
the time it typically takes uh, on site for them to build such a, a structure. Um, that's pretty much it. Now I will go to Roberto Naboni from the University of Southern Denmark, and he's going to speak about the computational design strategies for structural 3D printed architecture. Hello, uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to talk um, about computational design strategies uh, for structural 3D printed architecture. Um, this is basically um, telling you in a very brief way um, the research that we've been doing at uh, SDU Create um, over the last couple of years um, involving several researchers and uh, PhD students, including uh, Luca Brusagello, who just uh, defended his PhD on uh, uh, on this topic. Um, so um, why 3D concrete printing? Um, well, we do engage with different uh, um, architectural robotics uh, techniques, and uh, we have a lot of experience in other manufacturing. But 3D concrete printing um, has been uh, kind of um, one of our main areas over the last couple of years. And we do work on uh, uh, co-development of robotic setups, uh, um, studies of material behaviors, but especially developing computational design tools with the idea of pushing um, building technology using this, uh, this technique. Um, very quickly, what is the motivation that pushes us to do this is, of course, uh, the fact that concrete is uh, still and will be still the main construction material also in the future. So it's something that we do not want to move away from, but to use in a better way. And uh, as probably someone has already mentioned in the previous part of, of the webinar, um, concrete is one of the main uh, responsible for CO2 emissions, uh, and uh, this is estimated for about 7 to 8% of the global emissions of uh, carbon dioxide. So we try to focus on um, um, reducing these uh, with experimental projects. Uh, specifically, we focus on uh, uh, design development. So what I'm going to talk about does not really involve um, uh, some of the important research that uh, is currently conducted into optimizing uh, material recipes uh, for low carbon, um, but we focus on developing design strategies. Specifically, I'm going to talk um, about uh, um, horizontal structures, so beams and slabs. That's um, nearly 43 to 50% of the global um, consumption of concrete, you could say, in buildings. So that's basically a target area for us to to really make a difference in this in this field. Um, I'm going now to show to you a couple of the projects that we have been doing over the last years, and then then we can take questions about it. Um, so we started a couple of years ago working with the, this idea of 3D light beam. Essentially, um, the idea that we could use 3D concrete printing to do um, load bearing structures. Um, horizontal structure, so structure that works in bending and therefore nearly with the need of dealing with reinforcements as well. Um, and the idea is to, was to actually understand if we could uh, use reconquer print to use less material. So we started with a, um, a series of experiments. The first two have been uh, literally comparing um, beams that were solid with sort of porous grid beams. Um, and, uh, and both of these beams were essentially um, reinforced, but the idea here was to try to understand, does this work at all? Can we rely on this for um, uh, load-bearing structures? Um, of course, the premise is that most of the 3D concrete printing that is done in commercial applications is for vertical structures. So we've seen a lot of houses um, uh, that have been 3D printed worldwide uh, in new countries, um, but we thought that we should really focus on these two to, to identify the gap for, for making a difference into um, sustainable 3D concrete printing. Um, so we try to, to take the topic of reinforcements in the most uh, simple way. We, you could say um, looking into embedding directly rebars and then comparing self beams using the same amount of uh, steel reinforcements. So this is basically just a layout of the two beams that we started comparing with. And this is uh, basically just a screenshot of uh, the embedment of these uh, rebars within the, the bed uh, of the filament. Um, so uh, something that we did essentially 3D printing uh, both uh, this uh, solid beam and this uh, porous beam, as you can see here, and then we run a three-point bending test uh, with our colleagues from SU Structures. And uh, what we basically understood from this test is that we, we overall have um, yeah, good cohesion between filaments in many of the areas of the, the section of these beams. We get a kind of solid and continuous structure. 
Um, but also surprisingly, we got these results that illustrated that um, um, the porous beam, so this kind of grid beam, had um, had the highest basically strength uh, resistance, and uh, and that was explainable with a couple of things, uh, essentially related to how we inserted the rebars in a different ways between the two sets of beams. But nevertheless, this was an important lesson from us to, to realize that actually it, it does work, the idea of uh, removing and thinking of concrete beams that are not fully solid. Um, so in the comparison between the two beams, we have this idea that uh, the porous beam got this uh, plus 58% in terms of strength to weight ratio, which is our way of measuring basically the um, the, the reduction in material and therefore CO2 that, uh, that we made. Um, subsequently, we tried to use um, this test to conduct uh, uh, an LCA, cradle, cradle to grave LCA, um, where we look into the characterization of material process, manufacturing, operation, and disposals. And this is all published material, but the uh, key takeaway points from this study were that uh, we have basically reduction of 45% in terms of um, the environmental impact of the porous beam compared to the solid beam. And this is due to the fact that the porous structure augment the surface area that is exposed. And therefore we have this recarbonation effect, which help us um, essentially uh, reabsorbing part of the carbon dioxide. So encouraged by these results, we started um, investigating a little bit more the idea of these uh, porous elements and the idea that we could use infill structure uh, within uh, load-bearing concrete, uh, concrete beams. Um, so we started looking into a stress-based design. I would say this is an approach that we do use in several of our projects, um, but we were um, probably the first ones applying this to 3D concrete printing. And the idea that we could extract basically fields of principal stresses using these essentially to, uh, uh, to find geometries where to allocate materials for compression and tension, all these structures. And then where we have tension essentially put in uh, the rebar reinforcements that were bent exactly and placed in position. So this is a kind of exploded view to show a little bit of the, of the different uh, uh, steps of this procedure. And you can see here in this uh, yellow and kind of a blue uh, image where you can read the toolpath design, also how we can essentially modulate um, the thickness, the width of the filament according to the stresses by controlling the speed of the robot itself. So what we obtained here is this kind of uh, um, specimens beams that have this uh, uh, one plus 120 percent of strength to weight ratio compared to the initial solid beams and then we took it even further essentially applying the same process not only to the infill optimization but also to the shape optimization of this kind of beam so it is uh, how you could say um, a sort of iterative process where we we try to demonstrate that we could actually engage with several uh, steps of optimizations. Um, so these are some images of uh, what we call then a 3D light beam uh, plus. Um, and I'm going to show to you now a, a little um, an animation video, which basically tells you a little bit of how this was designed. So we set boundary conditions. Uh, we always test this with three point bending. And then we basically optimize the kind of cross section of this. And then we use this kind of uh, Cs to uh, generate basically uh, variations of these uh, fields patterns uh, of the, 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 the principal stresses. And then we proceed with the selection of some of these for trajectories that are useful for printing. So again, here you can see basically this animation, how the process is uh, relatively straightforward at that point. The, the sophisticness of it is basically given the fact that we control the layer width, as I was mentioning before, because of the speed uh, that um, um, control that we have uh, on the robot with a constant extrusion flow, and then we start rebirth at uh, constant intervals. So this is our uh, 3D light beam plus, um, which is basically our uh, last um, um, prototype in this series of of beams, and um, and this is basically the results that uh, that we got so far. So we got basically um, between 66 to 70 kilonewton. Uh, of of uh, of strength uh, to to failure um, for uh, for for these beams, um, but also this is not inserting this presentation. We were able to um, essentially 
um, simulate quite accurately the, the behavior of these beams by um, a finite element model that was developed through Abacus in nonlinear finite element model, where we characterize all of the interactions of the various filaments and, and various layers uh, between themselves. This is also a published material. So if you're curious about that, uh, you can find uh, more information. Um, so here we uh, obtain uh, 200 percent improvement in terms of strength to weight ratio uh, and consequently also uh, now we don't remember the exact numbers i think it was like reduction of 60 percent of carbon dioxide um we we developed with the lca kind of a, um, a, a publication a kind of understanding of how we could relate with our specific process basically reduction on in concrete uh, usage uh, to a uh, reduction in carbon dioxide. And this is for the specific case of prefabrication of these uh, reinforced concrete printed elements. Um, something that um, is a little bit new uh, that we have developed um, um, about uh, six months ago, but it's not published yet because we are sending out after, after review uh, a paper, um, is the 3D light, 3D light slab. is essentially the idea of applying the same process to a sort of isostatic rib slab. So here is basically what we, we have normally uh, behind the box. Basically what we use to design these things is essentially this uh, computational design workflow. I didn't want to be too boring, so I didn't show it for every beams, but we have several iterations um, and improvement of this. So what you see here is that you have a first phase where we kind of define all the design specifics, a first, a second part, where we have a, a linear finite element analysis, which allow us to, to gain basically information about principal moment lines and moment diagrams. And then we have essentially um, um, a process of optimization of uh, the specific layout of this rib slab. I'm going to, to show you uh, figures that uh, will make this more clear later. Um, what you can see then in the following parts where it's written toolpath design, basically, that's where we um, generate uh, not only geometries, but our robot control information, which are very specific for, for because we essentially need to take care not only of the, how to say, the, the element as design as a global geometry uh, with dimension, but we go into the details of the control of the specific element and also the reinforcement and so on. And also the specific uh, construction sequence uh, uh, of, of such a slab is, is relatively complex. So therefore it has to be fought throughout the whole process. What you see here in the fifth phase is a nonlinear finite element analysis. So that's where we use finite element not only to, to um, generate this kind of design patterns, but also to verify that this actually matches uh, the expectations. And, um, and then we verify this uh, with structural testing. So going through a little bit of the process in the next three minutes, this is a kind of the principal moment of field that we get. We run um, multi-objective um, optimization to evaluate how to reduce deflection uh, and usage of material at the same time. And by running these, we basically select our best candidate uh, option where we have uh, this kind of uh, um, layout for moment lines, which is then basically rectified in order to be printable. And then this is basically what you get in 3D. So on the right, you see basically the kind of concrete body uh, with a filament description. And on the left part of this illustration, you can actually see the reinforcements that we use, which encompass a steel mesh on top of surface, 2D bent uh, rebars, and also steel cables themselves. Um, this is an illustration, once again, that tells a little bit of how we control the width of the filament uh, through speed of the position. And just to show you a little bit images of the process itself uh, for this slab, which is about, uh, I don't remember now exact dimension is, uh, I think two, around 1.8 by 3.65 uh, um, meter in length. Um, something interesting is how long it, and it does it take to 3D print something like this is basically 90 minutes. And you see here the various phases. So this in this kind of exploded view, um, because we need to alternate essentially our phases of 3D printing with phases of rebar insertion. And this gives you a little bit of an outline of, of the timing. So I would still uh, say that this is a very convenient um, process in terms of fabrication time. And this is basically the results that we get in terms of, um, in terms of uh, uh, prototype. Roberto, two more minutes. Yeah. 
Okay. I'm wrapping up indeed. Um, so as you can see here, something that I haven't mentioned before. So this is a, a specific design case for two columns, as you can see here on the solid part on the left and right of this specimen. And uh, this, this um, uh, slab itself has been tested uh, again structurally and is basically compliant uh, and, uh, with Eurocode uh, prescriptions. And this is basically the result of a destructive test that was done uh, with a point load at the center of the of this lab itself. Um, so that's all from my side. Um, yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, continue. And I, I'm happy to give uh, the floor and uh, the screen to Gregor Fischer, who is going to be uh, present a paper on printing and reinforcement technology for 3D printing concrete structure. And he is also from Danish Technical University. Uh, my uh, yeah, contribution to this uh, is focusing mostly on how to install uh, reinforcement in 3D printed concrete structures. Um, one of the far-reaching goals that we would like to be able to, to accomplish with uh, 3D printing is, of course, printing in outer space where we really don't have any other option uh, besides uh, making machines and robots responsible for constructing uh, things for us. And here are some impressions of how people are envisioning, you know, how this would work. Uh, lots of equipment, um, fairly fancy layouts of things, uh, fairly advanced materials, uh, while what we have on the moon or on Mars uh, is very scarce, uh, not researched at all. Uh, so it will be quite an uphill battle. Right? So this is what we would like to do in the, I think, very distant future. Um, we can also look at what we have done so far, and this looks actually quite similar. Uh, so here on the top left, you can see uh, something built uh, in the Arctic, uh, an igloo, uh, and that looks strikingly similar to what uh, we are envisioning to build on Mars or on the moon. Um, and then there are some the other three images are showing something that is built in a very traditional way, also in areas where we don't have much of uh, advanced materials. Uh, and what I would like to point out here is, of course, that this is uh, also using um, yeah, substrate. Uh, in this case, in this case, it's some sort of soil bound with clay, uh, but also they are using reinforcement. And uh, in many yeah, presentations of uh, 3D printing, uh, this aspect is uh, oftentimes omitted, that we actually do need reinforcement in some way. And uh, it is actually a quite difficult um, problem to solve. How do we install reinforcement alongside printing of the concrete uh, and hopefully in an automated way? Um, so this is a big challenge uh, and uh, to come with a solution uh, is probably uh, quite difficult. So what we are doing so far, and this is yeah the, the current status, uh, is uh, we are basically printing formwork for concrete. Right? We are not printing the actual concrete structure, but it's mostly the, the formwork. And then we are installing in mostly very traditional ways the steel reinforcement, and we're casting the cavity in between the 3D printed formwork with conventional concrete. So on the moon or on Mars, we don't have that option. And ideally, uh, we would like to get away from doing that even in areas where we have the option uh, to do this uh, yeah, traditional uh, methodology. So there are a number of ways which have been investigated uh, for reinforcement. And we have heard in, in a few of the past presentations today uh, several ways to do that. Uh, the most common one, at least to my knowledge, is to just install conventional rebar uh, in inside the 3D printed formwork and then fill that gap with concrete. Uh, others are yeah, building the conventional steel reinforcement in a free form way. But then, as you can see here on the top right, they are basically filling that cage with concrete, also possible. Uh, then others are, yeah, printing the formwork out of uh, polymeric materials, and yet other solutions are suggesting a directed installation of fibers that, uh, that are being shot into the 3D printed concrete. So this is out there in terms of uh, current state of the art. 
the equipment that is needed is typically a gantry printer of some sort. Uh, there are other uh, methods uh, which are basically 3D printing, uh, which I have been out there for quite a while, these curb formers that you see on the, in the top middle. Um, others uh, on the bottom left here, the mini builder uh, is uh, basically suggesting that we let the, the thing that is printing the concrete climb on what has been previously printed. And I think this is a very interesting uh, suggestion. Uh, in principle, most of the 3D printing technologies rely on extruding mortar in one way or the other. We, we heard today we can go up to eight millimeters uh, in terms of aggregate size, but still we are pumping uh, fairly flowable material through a hose uh, and then extruding it at a nozzle. Um, so this is uh, what is currently being done. And as far as I have been informed, uh, now the use of conventional steel fiber reinforcement is also being considered to reinforce 3D, print, uh, 3D printed concrete structures. So uh, there are some other ways uh, which have been, I guess, more or less established. Uh, and you can see these two uh, scenarios here for installation of reinforcement. Uh, on the left is basically welding together or screwing together little segments of the reinforcement uh, while the concrete is being printed around it. So this is one method uh, that is possible for a simultaneous uh, installation of uh, reinforcement during the printing process. And the other one is leaving ducts in the printed layers. Uh, and then once we have reached a certain height uh, of a number of printed layers, then we install rebar and uh, grout uh, the duct in which the rebar has been installed. So what we would like to investigate or what we are suggesting is to basically knit uh, the reinforcement around the printed concrete, like uh, how you would knit uh, a scarf or a sweater uh, using wool. Um, we would like to do that uh, basically the same knitting and stitching process, uh, just not in in terms of uh, stitching cloth together, but stitching the concrete layers together. So we are envisioning two types of, basically two types uh, of robotic units. Uh, one is uh, a robot that is basically printing uh, the substrate, the concrete, uh, and the other one that is following behind it, which you can see here on the left in yellow, uh, is this reinforcement robot that is weaving the reinforcement uh, around the printed layers. So here is a, a more schematic view uh, of this process uh, where we have advancing uh, the printing of the concrete and then we come around with a device uh, that is uh, basically supported on the previously printed uh, layers. And this device is going around with a spool and needle basically uh, to weave the reinforcement uh, around it. So this is the schematic. And uh, we have tried this uh, so far only manually. Uh, we have uh, been successful in manually weaving the reinforcement around the printed concrete layers. Uh, so the principle of, is it possible to do? Yes, it's possible, but to do this in an automated way uh, is a is a very difficult task. And I will walk you through the difficulties that we are still encountering. But you can see here on the left and on the right, two samples where we are basically printing a layer, weaving the reinforcement around the first printed layer. Then we come and print the second substrate layer on it. Uh, and from a continuous spool, we are weaving the concrete, uh, the reinforcement around the concrete uh, and uh, providing sort of a reinforcement cage as we go uh, in the printing process. So this is not something that is pre-fabricated. Uh, uh, this is something that happens uh, yeah, in real time along with the printing process. Um, overall, uh, we have this main concept on the left uh, where we are printing and reinforcement shortly after. Uh, then we needed to come up with uh, sort of a knitting sequence uh, where we are 
uh, basically laying the the reinforcement around the currently printed layer, and we have to uh, yeah tighten it or or connect it to the previously established uh, reinforcement layer. Um, how to do that uh, while providing uh, a knot here that is active in terms of tension? Uh, that was a challenge. So we devised some sort of, of sequence here. You, if you spend a little bit of time, you can see how we do that. Uh, and then locally at the knot, uh, we have come up with a way of making a knot which is very similar to uh, what uh, grandma does when she's knitting a sweater for us. Um, very, very uh, similar uh, technology, if you will. Uh, to make that knot, which is able then to transfer tension uh, from the existing uh, string of reinforcement to the one that we would like to install. Um, alongside with that, uh, we also wanted to be able to print uh, with more conventional concrete, uh, first of all, containing larger aggregate, and then something that is not so sensitive to admixtures and time and so on. So we came up uh, with something that is basically compacting a fairly loose concrete. You can see that here uh, on the top left is a very dry and very basic uh, concrete mix. And we have a device here um, that is then able to shape this uh, and then climb up the structure to print additional layers. So that's happening right here. Okay, so now coming back to maybe a, a more closer view on what is this knot uh, that we're making, what does that look like? And here we on the left, we can see a, a zoom uh, view of this knot. Uh, and the, the trick here is that we have not two ends of string that we can simply connect with a simple knot. We have basically one continuous string of reinforcement, which we then have to weave around uh, and establish a knot, and this is this slide is showing uh, how we do that in the knot. And of course, now the challenge is how do we go from doing this manually uh, to something more automated? And one thing that we envisioned uh, initially was to come up with some sort of uh, yeah, needle arrangement, which is basically going around an existing knot and tightening the reinforcement uh, around that. Uh, that was one option. Uh, we have uh, worked with the Technical University in Aachen uh, in Germany to come up with uh, a knitting tool, basically. Uh, and they came up with this suggestion right here uh, on the left is showing just the image of it. And then on the right, they made a prototype, uh, which was successful to some extent. Uh, but we have learned from this exercise that uh, we need to put in quite a bit more work. Uh, ultimately, uh, those prototypes that we had manufactured in the lab, we just wanted to get some indication of, uh, is this uh, uh, a meaningful and promising way to, to provide the reinforcement in that way? And here, you know, we have uh, three specimens that we're showing basically on the, on the left here in orange is the unreinforced specimen, which is of course very brittle and fails quite early. And then we have two uh, specimens here, which we had reinforced uh, in this uh, knitting and weaving method uh, in blue and green. Uh, and you can see at least there is some hope uh, that there is something to it uh, in terms of uh, mechanical effect. So then similar to what uh, the previous presenters have shown, we are of course interested uh, to put the reinforcement uh, only in those locations where we actually have tensile forces. So we do the, the resultants of the tensile stresses, and then that gives us some sort of uh, weaving pattern that we should follow here for, for a slab, for example, under wind loads. This would be what the weaving pattern would look like. And if one day we are actually able to, to yeah, ask a robot to manufacture or to, to build this reinforcement cage for us, uh, we would then be able to to just uh, import uh, an, a file showing this uh, weaving pattern here and ask that robot to install this for us. So 
what I've shown is a is a suggestion, let's say, for an alternative uh, way to reinforce 3D printed uh, concrete structures where the printing and the reinforcement can happen uh, at the same time. Uh, I've shown also a way to basically form a layer of printed substrate uh, using a compaction technique, uh, which I think uh, might be promising. Uh, and then in the long run, of course, we would like to uh, get away from installing very fixed structures on the construction site, like a gantry, uh, towards more robot, ro mobile robot units uh, that can actually climb on the structure and print and reinforce uh, the structure that we would like to build. Thank you uh, for your attention, and uh, let me know if you have comments or questions. Our next speaker is from Norway. So that is Ole Bjorn Mo from the uh, Mechatronics Innovation Lab in Grimstad in the south of Norway. And it, the uh, heading is Implementing 3D Concrete Printing in Norwegian Construction Industry. Thank you very much for, uh, for the opportunity to, to present. Uh, my name is uh, Ole Bjorn Mo, and I will present our uh, project really uh, we call it uh, uh, in Norwegian we call it uh, sort of introducing uh, or concrete 3d printing for a greener construction industry uh, I've loosely translated it to greener construction here um, very quick about me uh, my name is Ole Bjørn Ellingsen Mo or Ole Bjørn Mo. I see on uh, Zoom that uh, my uh, name is uh, is uh, somewhat. Uh, it's not that complicated as it looks like. Uh, I'm the uh, additive manufacturing technology manager at Mechatronics Innovation Lab. Uh, I'll come back to who we are because I think we are not too well known. My background is material science, and I have been working with additive manufacturing since 2017. And uh, my uh, responsibility now, or my uh, what I try to do at least, is to introduce additive manufacturing to the Norwegian industries. And we are working with uh, metal, polymer, and concrete. So there are different industries that we are sort of aiming to uh, to uh, to show this, uh, show the capabilities of these technologies too. The agenda for my presentation is very, very brief. <laughs> it's uh, it's most a uh, little bit about Mechatronics Innovation Lab and mostly about the project we have ongoing. We have had a lot of technical good content uh, this far today. Uh, mine will unfortunately not be as, uh, as technical. Uh, I figured uh, uh, most of you had uh, then presented a lot of more interesting stuff than we have so far in the project. And we are working a, bit, a little bit differently. Anyhow, um, Mechatronics Innovation Lab is a national center for innovation, piloting, and technology qualification within mechatronics and additive manufacturing. So robotics, really, and additive manufacturing are two of our main uh, fields. And uh, one of our sort of uh, sayings is test before invest, meaning we have a lot of, uh, of novel equipment that we believe is valuable for the Norwegian industry. And we invite uh, customers and the industry to come test the technology, test how it, how it can fit their operations before they go into it. Uh, so we offer access to technology competence and also significant network. Um, so our mission is to increase the organization's competitiveness through the use and understanding of new technology. So we believe that we can take production home, we can be more efficient, we can uh, have higher quality with the use of technology. Uh, not just the use, but the correct use, of course. Um, so within additive manufacturing, we work on many different fields. Uh, we work in, with plastics, uh, with fused deposition modeling. We worked with metal, with two different metal technologies, as you can see here, and our concrete printer. Uh, you've seen a similar printer from, from Hyperion and uh, SDU 
today. We have the similar setup from Hyperion Robotics and um, yeah, some, some powder, metal powder stuff as well. Not so relevant for this. But what we do inside of the project is, so the project, uh, project uh, collaborators are here on this slide. So the project we are uh, we have ongoing is owned by Future Materials Catapult Center. And the participants are, as you can see from the end user side, it's Weidecke and Heidelberg Materials. So these are the companies that, that have an idea of how they want to implement uh, concrete printing in the industry for their applications. We have Nurconsult, who does the sort of design calculations and the uh, FEA, et cetera, looking up to how this fits to regulations. And we have Mapai and Heidelberg Materials, who supply sort of the chemicals and, and the materials as well. And on, on the university side, we have the University of Agder and the Architectural uh, University in, in Oslo. So together, we have quite a good bunch that together we can solve, hopefully, most of, or at least address, address most of the topics that come up, not solve everything, of course. Um, so this is our setup, as mentioned. Uh, it's a setup that has been delivered by Hyperion. It was delivered approximately nine, eight, eight nine months ago. So we are still new. That's when we started with concrete printing. Uh, I started to read about concrete a year ago, so I'm still new in the game, but it's a very interesting field. Uh, and we have had a lot of interest from the Norwegian industry, a lot of attention both from companies, but also from, from media. And that interest has predominantly been uh, regarding one of the advantages, which is sort of the green aspect, the way to uh, reduce material with this technology. But yeah, zooming out, the main project goal that we have is finding value in the construction industry with this technology. So we, uh, we are working on a quite a high TRL level. We uh, sort of scan the market in, uh, within robotics and additive manufacturing to see what do we believe prov can provide value for the Norwegian industries today. And we try to onboard that technology and try to showcase that. Uh, and we have to find value with it. There's no reason to adopt the technology if you cannot use it. But we believe there is a value for, for this uh, at a very high TRL level today. And we have to find where it is. So it's, it's, our hypothesis is that it's, it's within these four fields. Uh, it's within how can you reduce the material usage. So that's probably the most uh, interesting one that has, or at least the one that has gained most attention. It's about the efficiency and the digital workflow. How can this be implemented with the BIM software? How can uh, this be more efficient with the use of uh, fewer, uh, fewer um, workers? Right now we are printing with two people. Uh, the design freedom you get, you, we've seen a lot of that today from, uh, from uh, a lot of the presenters um, and also the improved logistics side of things. Uh, Hyperion showed how they took their printer outside in a tent and, and were able to produce prefabricated elements close to where it was needed. So that is also something we are looking into. So how, how to find value? Um, that's We are scanning different fields. Um, one of the sort of sub steps is of course to to find the applications to test and the foundations uh, we had a very good um, introduction to the, the technology by by the coursing and the introduction done by hyperion robotics for us and their foundation was a very good starting point for us so we have together with um, our project partners developed sort of a, a different kind of foundation where we try to to uh, reduce um, the material usage here as well. But we all have also looked into staircases and walls and different kinds of 
architectural elements outside of buildings like uh, or not necessarily architectural elements but um yeah what to say it's different installations outside of buildings that uh, require a bit of bit of freedom uh so we're looking into what are the benefits for those installations and for some of these applications we have challenges of course because they are bound by regulations so what kind of playing room do we actually have uh, we see that I'll, I'll come back to this point but it's it's not easy <laughs> always i'm sure you are aware um, are we achieving the necessary properties of course we are doing a lot of testing these days we are um, close to to finish to see what is then possible uh, the possibilities we have are, are uh, largely bound by the properties that we can achieve. And how does this fit into the digital digital way of working, as mentioned? And what competence does the construction industry need to to build in order to make this work and and scale this? Uh, and maybe the thing that I'm saying the most, and also uh yeah repeating myself time and time again for for all of these presentations that we have for the construction industry is that you have to design your construction or uh, yeah you, you have to design for the fabrication method in mind you cannot just take something that is intended for casting and just 3d print it that would never uh make sense economically at least so that is the challenge to to get people to yeah think differently, think about function more than fabrication. We have had uh, so far uh, a lot of learnings, and I imagine we'll have a lot of more learnings to come. Uh, one of the challenges we are facing is, of course, this on regulation. Um, I'm not, do not try to read the yellow ones. Uh, of course, it's just there to to show, but uh, but these are some of the uh, requirements that we believe is challenging, at least for for our setup. So we are eagerly awaiting the work done by, for example, Rylem to to update the requirements and for hope um, hoping that this will uh, go down into ISO standards uh, and and the Norwegian standards as well. But um, but we require some patience on that point. Um, but there are workarounds, of course. We could get the owner of the building or the owner of the installation to, to accept risk. And we can also do, um, do sort of technical approval, but that is costly. Um, so that is a, an extra challenge for us to find these, not only the applications that uh, 3D printing would be applicable for, but it should be so applicable that you're willing to take the risk or you're willing to pay extra for the technical approval. And that's that's a challenge. And so we still need to, to work to, to find those really, really good applications. One that is very interesting is the applications that can benefit greatly from parametric design. So staircases we have been working a lot with we have now a um, parametric script that can provide, so you input uh, your staircase requirements based on standards. So how tall each step should be, how, how deep they should be, the width of the staircase, how many steps it should be made of. And the script will uh, push out a, yeah, what we call the digital formwork. And that digital formwork will just be updated quickly by uh, your requirements. And from, from there, we see that there is definitely a, a value for how quickly you can react to, to very varying. Uh, in a large project, you, you, it makes sense to, it now makes sense to have a great uh, variance of, of the stairs if, if, that is, if, if that's needed, of course. So that's, it's, it's very interesting to, to see the flexibility of it. As I mentioned, we are working on a uh, what I believe is a higher TRL level. Uh, so we want this to be pushed into the industry. We want, we want to see use cases. We want to see commercialization of this. 
So we are trying to, to find that with our uh, project partners. But we, of, of course, see that the research is, is very important in order to gain trust uh, as well. So we, we are, uh, we are um, involving students on all different levels, uh, bachelor, master's, and PhD. And we have also some, some EU proposals ongoing. And maybe there are other opportunities for collaboration as well. So uh, we see uh, a great interest in this, and we believe there are many many open topics. Um, and that's pretty much what I had. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's not so much new information for for you, but it's uh, the new information is that uh, things are happening in Norway as well. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, so I, I would like to present for all of you, Jan Sushovsevsky uh, from RICE, the Research Institute of Sweden. And he is going to give a presentation called Industrial Application of 3D Concrete Printing, Materials Printing Technology and Product Development. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm a unit manager for my group at RICE, Research Institute of Sweden, uh, called Material Design, working with uh, cement and concrete in general. And uh, today's presentation is uh, prepared together with my colleague, Odas uh, Shauthari, that is also here, that is leader, leading our uh, first uh, project on 3D concrete printing. Uh, and uh, I, I, yeah, I wanted to acknowledge his, uh, his input in this presentation. And uh, we will get back to the project a bit later. Uh, just two words about our unit. Uh, we are uh, at the moment 18 colleagues working with uh, mainly r and projects but also uh, services like advanced testing and, and consulting, uh, damage assessment, and so on. And we work in uh, six uh, focus areas related to binder chemistry, applied concrete technology, uh, durability of uh, uh, and service life of structures, uh, recycling and circularity, uh, dynamic injections uh, for uh, rock fractures, and also 3D printing, which I will talk about today. And uh, of course, uh, many, many you have already mentioned uh, the motivation. The motivation is that uh, over the last 100 years, not, not much has changed in our way of manufacturing or constructing buildings. Uh, you see those two pictures uh, that I borrowed from Felix Block uh, from ETH Zurich. And uh, the only thing maybe that we see is different is that the helmets are there, but still we have uh, a lot of manual labor uh, tough uh, work environment uh, that is uh, that is at the moment of the construction site, and also the the process. It's it's still a, a filled uh, solid material mostly. If we don't co talk about hollow core slabs or, or so, um, not really optimal. And uh, but we have a future challenges uh, until two thousand twenty five. It is uh, it is for, for, uh, it is uh, foreseen that the need for new buildings and so on will increase by 30% due to uh, yeah, urbanization, uh, also a growth of, of uh, population uh, worldwide. And at the same time, uh, we have lower and lower amount of skilled uh, labor. Uh, and uh, also, uh, yeah, it's, it's also increasing the cost. Uh, the, the manual labor is more and more costly. And in long terms, at the same time, we have, um, goals to increase our production capacities and to decrease carbon footprint of course uh, and of course how, what is the answer to those uh, those challenges one of them could be 3d concrete printing and uh, many advantages has been mentioned before uh, additive manufacturing is not uh, not so new either we already we have been running a center for additive manufacturing at rice uh, since uh, a few years back working with printing of polymers and, uh, and metals. Um, and, and the advantages are, are clear. It's a lower cost due to lack of molds, less labor, less material, uh, faster manufacturing, and also ma ma manufacturing on demand. Um, advanced designs, so new shapes, new functionalities, uh, additional resource of efficiency, and also better work environments, less accidents, higher quality, and so on. Uh, so, yeah, many new possibilities. And when we were starting at RISE, uh, thinking about 3D concrete printing, uh, we started internal project uh, that focused on the analysis of the Swedish market uh, related to prefabricated concrete products. Um, 
as we talked about advanced designs, uh, resource ef efficiency, and so on, uh, we we don't believe much that there is a huge potential in uh, on-site printing of uh, of walls, which is the most uh, most popular, uh, you might say, uh, application at the moment. Uh, we thought about prefab. We don't have that good uh, weather conditions in Sweden, to but uh, yeah, impressive what Hyperion showed with the with the balloon or uh, the uh, the hole. Uh, however, yeah, we thought about prefabrication industry. So what we did, we we contacted 32 prefab companies in Sweden uh, with a request to answer um, uh, questions about the potential of 3D printing and how do they see about uh, applications in their their industry, their portfolio, their products. Uh, what we've uh, identified in those uh, this pre-study is that uh, more or less 70% of the volume it's uh, standard components like uh, massive slabs or hollow core decks or sandwich panels, uh, wall panels which are already quite uh, yeah efficient, well designed you might say. But we have also a big part of complex um, special components like uh, foundations already mentioned, uh, advanced facades for um, yeah, both aesthetic um, aesthetic demands of architectural designs, uh, special foundations for machines, but also uh, yeah, machinery cabinets and so on and so forth. And uh, those we thought are particularly interesting for three D printing. They have higher potential to do um, to optimize them. And uh, the topological optimization it's not a new um, new technology. It has been uh, known in the um, automotive industry, space industry, and so on for quite a while. And it's just removing the parts of materials that are not uh, structurally needed uh, and uh, by numerical simulation. Uh, here is an example of a topological optimization process from uh, ETH Zurich uh, when they uh, created a, uh, optimized the slab by reducing more or less 70% of the volume uh, and making it still structurally uh, functioning or having the same load bearing capacity. Um, this one was not actually 3D printed, uh, but it was uh, casted in a 3D printed mold. The mold was uh, in a sand or stabilized sand and then was removed. It's also an interesting uh, application, you might say. Um, one of the aspects that is particularly interesting in Nordic countries, and we are all from Nordic countries, is the, the durability um, and uh, service life. This is also a big aspect to to uh, to study, and a challenge for three D printing where we have interlayers. Uh, um, however, when we talk about uh, environmental impacts, we have to remember that we have yeah multiple multiple aspects of, uh, of, of sustainability, which is uh, embedded CO2 uh, per unit volume. And in, though, in that case, 3D printing is actually not that sustainable because we are using quite a lot of binder um, comparing to normal concrete, as you can see in this, uh, in this table from um, an article listed below. Uh, the average uh, paste volume or uh, OPC um, uh, content is around five five hundred or or, um, or 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 so uh, five hundred kilograms per cubic meter. While in normal concrete, it can be around two hundred or so. Also, we are using much finer aggregates at the moment. Uh, not many studies using uh, aggregates higher than four millimeters. Uh, actually, also really appreciate to see that some of you are doing these trials and working with that aspect. But still, we are far from thirty-two millimeters and and higher uh, for bigger structures uh, so in fact there is uh, the volume that we can really make the the, the the impact on an, an on the sustainability part uh, coming to our project um, the the previous slides were kind of inspirational and the pre-study why we did this project uh, with so we did this uh, market pre-study in sweden uh, we found the stakeholders or end users of the technology and uh, yeah, we propose to we propose to work both with material development, product design, production process with three D printing, and uh, printing the the test cases in practice. And so function the project has an aim to uh, to function as a test, but you might say, 
for for the development from uh, from from material to um, to or from from the market needs to the industrial application. We also look into sustainability and cost analysis and uh, business models and value chain related to 3D printing in the project, together with multiple partners that you see on the left. Uh, the first test case that we work uh, on for uh, Bendesh, it's actually a, um, a storm well. And as you see, already today in their production process, they use a robotic arm, uh, but uh, it is used to prepare a formwork, a complex formwork uh, for a well that needs to um, connect pipes of different diameters and after the, on the, under different angles. Uh, and to, today they cut it in styrofoam. Uh, the molds are one-time use, uh, so it's uh, the least sustainable solution uh, you might imagine, uh, probably. Uh, it's uh, taking a lot of time and costs a lot of money. And also, it's uh, yeah, it's one time. And they already have a robot. So we thought, why don't we replace uh, the, the cutting robot with uh, additive manufacturing to both make it yeah, faster and more sustainable. The second, uh, the second um, test cases related to uh, staircases or stairs, and also uh, specifically to the most more complex uh, stair uh, shapes. Uh, as you see on the on the right, it's connected to work with uh, UBAP, Ritzaham uh, Betong. And uh, there, we, there we work with, uh, um, uh, then we want to reduce the time and the labor and also the complex formwork that is used usually today. Uh, so it takes five, takes six days to actually prepare the formwork and the reinforcement for for uh, simi those uh, stairs or, or similar. And also, uh, mechanically, uh, stairs are quite favorable because we don't need that much reinforcement as, for example, in a slab, um, in in simple stairs. Or as you showed in, uh, in some results, some cases we don't need uh, reinforcement at all. And the third test case is a peculiarity from um, a Volvo cars that actually um, works with testing of their cars in um, on a test tracks where they need to um, reflect very uh, they want to uh, reflect very uh, in a very high resolution the surfaces uh, of different places of different types of surfaces and they they need to be uh, repeatable uh, so have the same geometry every time uh, they they cast it. Um, and uh, they use laser scanning to obtain a surface and then want to transform it into into a real surface in concrete. Um, so, of course, we will we will look into that, how we can do that instead of cutting this complex, complex formwork with the CNC machines and so on today. However, of course, if we talk about infrastructure um, and it is a part of the infrastructure, we have challenges again related to durability and um, uh, salt and frost and so on and so forth. So many material challenges. So uh, here are a few uh, few examples from what is being done worldwide. Uh, Hyperion probably recognizes their own <laughs> their own foundation, uh, and uh, we are sure that the 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 the, the goal uh, or the goal for for us at Rice working with three D printing is to work with applications. Um, and we are motivated by applications, uh, so um, we need we need the end users. Um, we've recently uh, finalized the investment in this three um, D facility uh, with a, a robot arm from ABB. Uh, it is uh, on a truck, so it, it enables of printing quite large elements uh, in a working space uh, eight on three on three meters. And uh, we have uh, two different printing pumps for it, uh, one for mortar and one for concrete. So we have an ambition to work also with higher uh, aggregate sizes. And um, I think nobody um, mentioned uh, this technology because um, we are going to work with um, uh, both one component printing and two component printing where we can um, yeah, sacrifice or not take care that much of the um, uh, setting time and so on for the original uh, mortar composition because we can uh, we can inject accelerator at the end um, of the process and by that uh, harden our material very fast it's also very uh, handy for cleaning and uh, maintenance of, of the equipment but also enables 
to produce very complex shapes, as you can see on the on the picture. We also have possibility of possibility of um, providing customable printing nozzles, uh, 3D printed in polymer uh, of different sizes, and also for placing in uh, steel fibers and aligning them. This is also one of the, the goals of our project. And uh, this I've already mentioned more or less, but uh, we we work uh, both with material related to strength, durability, and aesthetics, and both with mortar and concrete and different types of reinforcements, uh, also non-metallic reinforcements. Um, we also we also provide element uh, structural design. We can verify other relevant properties like mechanical, thermal, and acoustic at rise, which is also a, a big advantage, I think. Uh, we print smaller prototypes, and uh, we can we can even uh, maybe uh, we will see uh, how how it how it will go, but um, uh, produce maybe uh, small architecture objects or artwork if needed, or if requested. Um, so this uh, this uh, maybe I come back to this one. Those three uh, small objects are the first prototypes that we printed um, this month, actually. Uh, in our in our facility and uh, one more uh, thought or one more um, uh, one more possibility that we see is to print multiple materials and to use um, competences of our colleagues uh, at the application center for active manufacturing to print uh, polymer reinforcements or uh, metal reinforcements in and connected to 3d printing of concrete uh, and by that, uh, automatize one in 100% the process uh, instead of placing reinforcement manually or or so. So this was everything I prepared for today. Maybe not many really answer as a lot of promises, uh, but uh, as I mentioned, we are early uh, in our project. Um, I added a link uh, in this at uh, this slide on the right top corner uh, to our website uh, for for our test bed. And also, um, some of you might uh, um, received an invitation, but if you haven't, uh, we invite on the twenty third of twenty um, third of April. We have an opening of our three uh, D printing test bed, and uh, you are welcome to contact me afterwards if you haven't got an invitation uh, and if you are interested. So thank you very much for attention. Thank, thank you very much, Jo interesting to see and, and listen perhaps i i could uh, then conclude i would like to i i, I we see that this seems to be a very interesting and, and uh, 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 exciting topic and a uh, lot, lot of, of uh, research and development are, are ongoing in, in our four countries and um, I think it was beneficial to the, 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 with this opportunity to see what not only we are doing in Sweden for me, in, in also the other countries, and I, I hope the same for for uh, participants from Norway, Denmark, and Finland that, that you feel the same. Uh, I would like to thank all the uh, nine uh, speakers, and, and uh, I, all of them they they were very helpful for me to, to keep to the schedule it was tight but that on the other hand we managed to to uh, conclude i will also thank people who have raised questions in the in the chat and finally i will give a, a very big thank to joran andreason who has uh, helped me organizing this and, and he he is the the man behind everything so Thank you, Joram, for excellent help. So thank you all for attending.